Can you hear me now? Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. That's powerful prayer, <laughs> show. <clears throat> Father, we have gathered this morning the church in the church house. We are grateful, Father, that you have provided for us the opportunity for us to come as family, as brothers and sisters in Christ. We have so much, Father, to be grateful and thankful for. You bestowed on us things that we neither earn nor do we deserve, but you blessed us, Father, right out of our socks. And so as we gathered this morning, we ask that everything that is done this morning, this day, all day, would be to your honor and to your glory. We ask all of this, Father, in the powerful, matchless name of our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, that he might be honored and glorified. And all of us together say, Amen. Amen. Well, are you gracing us with the tickling of the ivory this morning? Uh, yes, sir. I will get her done. Let's look at 133. Pastor requested we sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a judge of thoughts and intents of the heart. 
All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be fully equipped unto all good works. We're going to be visiting several passages this morning uh, so we can, uh, we can start, as it were, with Genesis. Let's open God's Word this morning to Genesis. We're going to start with Genesis chapter 12. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Now let, let's just take a few moments, if you will, please, just to open our hearts and our minds to the truth, gather our thoughts, and uh, concentrate and focus. So let's bow together just a little while. Father, as we said earlier this morning, we have things on our hearts and on our minds. We've come before the throne this morning knowing that you are the sovereign God that we serve. And we pray, Father, that as we look into your, your inerrant word of truth, that you would open our hearts and our minds to the truth. Enable us, Father, to stay focused in the times in which we find ourselves. And yet, we understand and realize that nothing transpires in our lives about which you are not totally aware. So we ask, Father, that God the Holy Spirit would enlighten us, teach us, and show us. Enable us to continue to grow in grace and in the full knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he might be honored and glorified. And all of us together say, Amen. Amen. <laughs> there are a number of things that we can say about our culture and events that have transpired over the past uh, few weeks. Things that have not only gripped our our focus and our attitude, but things that, that we as the body of Christ <clears throat> feel that we want to wonder, we tend to wonder just what in reality is going on. Well, we're in the end times. We are in what I believe to be the waning hours, as it were, of the church age. We look at Israel, for example, just as an example, and we see that multitudes of individuals have come against Israel, um, even to the point of making feeble attempts at trying to tell them how they should run their war. They are involved in a full-scale war. Uh, they are being confronted by, by uh, uh, enemies, as it were, proxies on all sides. And so they will defend themselves and they will do whatever is necessary for them to survive because it is a matter of survival for the nation of Israel. By the same token, I would venture to say that us, our nation, has gone from satanic freefall to divine judgment. I think that things are going to transpire as we will see that will only tend to amplify the fact that we are the recipients 
of divine judgment. You see, you, you, you cannot, and as we will see as we go through our collective scriptures this morning, you can't mandate and dictate what you should think or how another sovereign nation should function without without being the receptive or not receiving the fallout from that. And what is the fallout? Divine judgment as far as Israel is concerned. Now, we're looking at several passages this morning, as I said. And I want us to start, we're going to be going, just so that you know, from Genesis to the book of Psalms. And then we'll look at what's called the Minor Prophets. I have no idea why they're called the Minor Prophets. Although, except uh, their, their writings are a little bit, their books are a little bit shorter than uh, the Major Prophets. But these individuals are prophets, and we're going to be looking at Joel and Zechariah. So, first of all, we're looking at Genesis chapter 12, and I want us to take a look at just the first four verses of chapter 12, and I think we will see uh, this emphasizes two things. First, the Abrahamic covenant, and then it emphasizes the fact that Abraham, or Abram, as he was called prior, uh, uh, before, <clears throat> before God changed his name, is very specific about where we stand as nations. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 12, Genesis. Now, the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. Emphasis, the land which I will show you. Verse 2, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I don't think it gets any clearer than that. I really think that in verse 12 and preceding, God has said exactly what he's going to do and why he's going to do it. There was a reason why why God did and has done what he has promised to do for Abram. By the way, so that you know, as we will see, the Abrahamic covenant is unconditional and everlasting. There's no expiration date there. This is the granddaddy, as it were, of all of the covenants. And we're going to see that as we go through our scriptures this morning. Now, I want us to go from chapter 12 to chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. Oh, you made a good part this morning. <laughs> Thank Genesis you. chapter 15. Uh, let's start with verse 1 of chapter 15. And we'll, we'll go 
through this, this chapter 15. <clears throat> After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, born in my house is one in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, This man, and this is verse 4, chapter 15, This man will not be your heir, but one who shall come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And he, Lord God, took him, Abram, outside and said, Now, Look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And verse 7, He, God, said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur, the Chaldeans, to give you this land to possess it. Verse 8. O Lord God, how may I know that I shall possess it? So he, God, said to him, Abram, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat and a female <clears throat> and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Then he brought all of these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came down upon the Caucasus, and Abram drove them away. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror, and great darkness fell upon him. And God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years, but I will also judge the nation whom they have served, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. Who is he speaking of? He's talking about the enslaved time in Egypt and the 12 sons of, of, of uh, Jacob went in at that time, but they came out 400 years later plus the 12 tribes of Israel. So we read on. Verse 15, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. A hundred and sixty something, I think. He was. Anyway. <clears throat> then the fourth generation, they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites has not been completed. It came about when the sun had set that it was very dark. And behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. On that day, 
the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. The Kenites, the Kizzites, the Gadmonites, the Hittites, the Persazites, the Raphim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gizzazites, and the Jebusites. So what did he do? What did our God do for Abram? He gave him the land which they possess now. And it's based on a covenant that he established. And how do we know that? Because everything that they laid signifying the covenant, the pieces were consumed. And who did the consuming? Our sovereign God. So where was Abram when all of this was going on? Sleeping. Why? Because the covenant does not depend on Abram. He is the recipient. The covenant depends on our sovereign God who guaranteed the covenant. That's why he was sleeping. Literally, he doesn't have the first nickel in the dime. The power of Almighty God. That's why they possess the land. And that's why they will possess the land. 300,000 square miles of land belongs to Israel. Praise be to our God. Now, there's a sign coming up. Look at verse 17, if you will. Verse 17, starting at verse 1. You mean chapter 17? Chapter 17. Verse 17, right? No. Chapter 17, 30, starting at verse 1. It's <laughs> been a long day. Uh, <laughs> Genesis chapter 17, starting at verse 1. Now when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be, and be blameless. Here again, verse 2, I will establish my covenant between me and you. And I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face. And God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. And you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram. But your name shall be Abraham, for I will make you the father of a multitude of nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Verse 8, I will give to you and your descendants after you the land <coughs> of your sojourning your land the land of your sojourn all the land of Canaan for everlasting possession and I will be their God God said further to Abraham now as for you 
You shall keep my covenant and you and your descendants after you throughout their generation. Verse 10. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. And it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. Verse 12. Verse 12. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised. Throughout your generation, a servant who is bought, who is born in your house, or who is bought with money from uh, any foreigner who is not of your descendants, a servant who is born in your house, or who is bought with your money, shall surely be circumcised. This shall be my covenant between your flesh as an everlasting covenant. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people and has broken my covenant. Then God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall call her name. You shall not call her name Sarai, but you shall call her name Sarah. I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear his child? And Abram said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, No, but Sarah your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. <laughs> Behold, I will bless him, and I will make him fruitful, and he will, <clears throat> he will multiply. I will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But, but, verse 21, my covenant, I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. So what you're saying, nothing will I get without God is impossible. Nothing. We serve a sovereign God. Why is he sovereign? Because he can do whatever he wants to do. As far as Ishmael is concerned, you ever heard of the Mishraelites? The Ishmaelites are the Arabs of the world. These are the recipients of Ishmael. So where is the covenant? This is the sign of the covenant. This is the covenant. This is where we need to be. So who does the land belong to? What did God say? The land belongs to Israel. So what are we fighting over? A two-state solution? Not according to what our inerrant word of God says.
It's there of it. So what we need to do is quit <clears throat> hampering on a two-state solution, which is <clears throat> non-covenant. It is non-biblical. Our sovereign God established the covenant and the sign of the covenant, circumcision. You cannot change that. Christ Jesus our Lord, an eight-day-old baby, was circumcised. And our sovereign God, Christ Jesus our Lord, was born Jewish in Bethlehem, not Pennsylvania, Israel. <laughs> So where do we go from here now that we have established the nation belongs to Israel? Just so that you know prophetically, Israel is in the land. They've been there since 1948 and they keep coming home. It's their nation. So where do we go from here? Well, Let's go to the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms is located right in the middle of our Bible. By the way, let me see if I can find it rather quickly, quickly, quickly. On the way to uh, On the way to on the way to uh, uh, the book of Psalms, stop if you will, please, in Joshua. I just want you to take a look at something here in Joshua. You know who Joshua was, right? Joshua was actually. <coughs> <coughs> the commander after Moses died. But I want you to look, if you will, just share with me here. We are in Joshua chapter 5, and I want you to take a look at verses 13 to 15. 13 to 15, Joshua chapter 5. Now it came about, when Joshua was, a, was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Verse 14, he said, No. Rather, I indeed now come as captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? The captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals. You are Feet are in a place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. That sound familiar? What did God say to Moses on Sinai? Remove your sandals. For the, where you are standing is holy ground. Let's go to Psalm 33 to start with, please. Psalm 33. Let's start with verse 10, or verse 11. 
And the counsel of the Lord uh, stands forever. We are in Psalm 33, starting at verse 11. The plans of his heart from generation to generation, verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. So who are the chosen? Israelites. So what does that do for us as the church? We have been grafted in. We are the body of Christ. So if we are the body of Christ, and we are, is there a covenant to the church? Yes. There is also a covenant to Israel. So, <clears throat> are we blessed because of who and what we are? No. We're blessed because of who and what He is. We are the recipients of so great salvation because of who and what He is not because of who and what we are. We are the ecclesia, the called out ones. We have been called out by the grace of our sovereign God. And so we go on from Psalm 33 over to Psalm 122. 122. One hundred twenty two is just a short sum. Or actually one hundred twenty one. Let's start with one hundred and twenty one. Verse one of Psalm one hundred twenty one. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains, from whence shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Verse 5. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you. <clears throat> by day nor the moon by night the Lord will protect you from all evil he will keep your soul the Lord will guide you going out and you coming in from this time forth and forever so look at uh, Psalm 21 or 22 I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, that is built as a city that is compact together, to whom the tribes go up, even the tribes of the Lord an ordinance of Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord for their thrones were set for judgment the thrones of the house of David pray for the peace of Jerusalem may they prosper who love you May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, may peace be within you for the sake of the house 
of the Lord our God. I will seek your good. Pray for the peace in Jerusalem. Pray for Israel. <clears throat> now, if you will, please. Let's go over to the book of Hang on just a minute. It was here when I left the house. I want to turn, if you will, please, to Zechariah. On the way to Zechariah, stop, if you will, please, to Joel, chapter 3. Joel chapter 3. I want us to look at the first three verses. Joel chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. <clears throat> For behold, in those days and at that time when I, when I restore a portion of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. I will enter into judgment with them together on behalf of my people, my inheritance Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and they have divided my land. They have also cast lots for my people and traded a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. So what you say? He's saying, don't divide the land. He's saying, don't even think about it. Because if you do that, it won't be good for you. Look at, if you will, please, Zachariah. And this will, this will finish us up. Zachariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. Let's look, if you will, please. First five verses or so. Zechariah chapter 12. He said, The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel Thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around and when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. It will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it <clears throat> will be severely injured, 
and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. In that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with, with bewilderment and his rider with madness, but I will watch over the house of Judah while I strike every horse of the people blindness. Then the clans of Judah will say in their hearts, a strong support for us are the inheritance of Jerusalem through the Lord of hosts, their God. We've gone through several passages of Scripture this morning. We've seen what the sovereign God that we serve has to say about Israel. We've heard what he had to say in his inerrant, immutable word. Rest assured, our God doesn't make mistakes. There's no shortcoming here. There's nothing about this that he has minced words or something that is not understandable. The Lord God has said explicitly, the covenant is. These are the covenant people. This is Israel. This is my land. I hold the title deed. So we need to understand and realize as our nation is concerned, these are not things that we need to get involved in. We need to stand with Israel. And there's no doubt of that. As long as we are the body of Christ, as long as we are the called out ones and we are the ecclesia, we must stand with our brothers and sisters in Israel. So, let's bow together, shall we? Father, we thank you for the fact that you have allowed us to look into your inerrant word this morning to understand and realize without a doubt that you are the sovereign God that we serve. You are the one who's in total control. And you are the one who has provided for us the understanding unequivocally. The covenant is to Abraham. The sign is circumcision and the people have the land the land is Israel and the people are the Israelites we pray father for all of those that are not here this morning those that are are for whatever the reasons we pray for all of those that are here all of the families we thank you father for this time that you have provided for us to look in your name, word of truth. That this portion of your word would be a source of challenge and blessing. Enable us, Father, to continue to grow in grace and in the full knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and everybody said. Amen. Amen. Jake, you want to uh, collect the offering, please? Thank you. Yeah. Let's bow together. Oh, sorry. Let's bow together, shall we?
Father, we thank you for the privilege that you have provided for us as stewards to be able to return to you that which you have trusted to us. We ask, Father, that all of it would be for the furthering of the kingdom. We ask all of this in the powerful master's name of our Lord, Savior, and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, that he might be honored and glorified. And all of us together say, Amen. Amen. Praise God, God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you. We pray first of all for those families that are not here this morning for whatever the reasons. We pray for those that are here and those, Father, that you have heard us mention. We pray for those that are sick, hospitalized, afflicted, and shut in. All of our brothers and sisters around the globe that are being persecuted, even as we speak, in multitudes of countries around the globe. We pray for peace in Jerusalem, the war that's going on in Israel. We pray for the president, the prime minister, the war cabinet, the Knesset, and every single uh, one of, of the Israelites. We pray, Father, that, that your will be done, that what needs to happen, what, what is to your will and to your honor and your glory will be accomplished. We pray, Father, for everything that weighs heavy on our hearts and on our minds, our military, our first responders. Uh, we pray for those, Father, that are our, our loved ones who don't know Christ the Savior. We pray all of these things, Father, in word, thought, and deed, and we pray... <clears throat> In the powerful Master's name, of our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, that he might be honored and glorified. All of us together say, Amen. 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 May God bless one and all and grant you grace, peace, mercy, and joy. Back at you. <laughs> you guys all have a good week. Did you have a good week?